Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce as our second speaker, Professor Ian Van Hartman from my alma mater, University of Manchester. He's going to be talking about a skeptical book, skeptical at reading based series of space. Right, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, okay, thank you to the organisers for inviting me. Nice to be here. Um, I shall be talking today about um, some very concrete problems um, in spatial reasoning that have been studied by a small but concerted band of computer scientists over recent decades. So I would ask everyone to think in very concrete terms about when I talk about spatial reasoning, I really mean spatial reasoning. The most important part of this talk is the first 10 minutes. I want to begin with uh, region connection calculus, which is a, a, spatial, a formalism for spatial reasoning, which I think almost everyone here will know, but if not, uh, you, sh you should pick it up very quickly. Then I'll be talking about uh, connectedness in the topological sense, putting regions together, and then I'll, the last part of the talk is probably of most interest to the, the current audience, which is on first order spatial logics. Uh, but we'll see if and when we get there, uh, what the situation is. The language RCC 8, or the Region Connection Calculus 8, was proposed by uh, uh, Randall, Tsui and Cohn from the University of Leeds in 1992. Um, Max Egenhofer had an essentially equivalent formulation. It's a language in which there are six primitive predicates. And I'll read the, the mnemonics out so you understand what they mean if you're new to you. Tangential proper part, non-tangential proper part, partial overlap, disconnection, um, external connection, and equality. The arguments of these predicates are uh, just variables, logical variables, but you are to think of these variables as standing for regions of space. And the semantics is illustrated for disks in the plane here. So these two uh, regions, R1 and R2, are disconnected. These are externally connected. They touch at the boundary but don't overlap. These partially overlap. These are equal. Uh, R is here a tangential proper part of S. And R is here a non-tangential proper part of S. It does not touch the boundary. You may be wondering why it is called RCC8 and not RCC6, since there are six primitive predicates, and the answer is that two of them are asymmetric, and if you take the converses, you get eight. So we have a language here for talking about the relationship between regions. So the idea is that um, we want to describe configuration, spatial configurations in purely qualitative terms, and then reason with it. And we want to make, perform logical deductions, we want to tell whether, things, whether specifications are realizable, and so on. And so that's the basic idea of the language. I think probably everyone here has seen this language in one form or another. So slightly more formally, variables are taken to range over regions of some space, that is subsets of some topological space, and the uh, primitive predicates are always given completely fixed topological interpretations. For example, this is the, the interpretation of the external connectedness predicate. Two regions, A and B, are externally connected just in case they share, um, just in case they have points in common, but their topological interiors do not have any points in common. So I will use little circle to mean the topological interior of a region, and um, I think I'll, I'll introduce various bits of idiosyncratic terminology as I go along. If I forget to do so, please interrupt me if something's unclear. Okay? So this is the standard definition of external connectedness. Two regions are externally connected just in case they have points in common, but no interior points in common, so they just touch at the edge. Here's an example of uh, RCC8 formulas. RCC8 formulas are completely simple, right? There's almost no syntax. You can, so here we have uh, three variables, R1, R2, and R, R, uh, four variables, R1, R2, R3, R4. We are told that R1 and R2 are in external contact. We are told that R1 is a tangential proper part of R3. We are told that R2 is a non-tangential proper part of R4. And here are two satisfying configurations. So this is a satisfying configuration. You see that R1 is a externally connected to R2. R1 is a tangential proper part of R3. R2 is a non-tangential proper part of R4, and so on. Right, so this is a, just a picture realizing that 
description. And here is another picture. Plenty of pictures realising this description. These, by the way, are, of course, regi regions here are, in, are understood as just blobs in the plane. I'll be, I'll, I'll be more precise about what a region is in one moment. Um, on the other hand, you might think that if we add this extra uh, constraint, uh, this extra formula, which says that R3 is externally connected to R4, you cannot realise uh, the resulting configuration. You cannot realise the resulting description. And that is indeed the case. Because if R1 is externally connected to R2, R1 is a tangential proper part of R3, R2 is completely contained within R4, as specified in these constraints, then R3 and R4 have to have some interior points in common. I'm, I want, I'm asking you to reason intuitively at this point. Okay, so if I add the, the additional constraint, R3 is externally connected to R4, in other words, they touch but not, uh, that their interiors don't, that's, that resulting configuration is not satisfiable. So we have satisfiable formulas and not satisfiable formulas. That simple. Okay, that's the language that we're talking about. So we've defined the language, uh, and now, uh, so you write the language, just six primitive predicates, the arguments to the predicates are variables, and formulas are just collections of, of atomic assertions. Nothing more. That's the language. Now, what about the interpretation of the language? Well, I've more or less given it, but we need to be a bit clearer about what we mean by a region. Again, this will be familiar to everyone here, I'm sure, so I'll go through it quickly. Um, if T is a topological space, a subset of that space is said to be regular closed if it is equal to the closure of, the interior, of its interior. Again, more idiosyncratic terminology. Remember, circle means take the topological interior of a region. Minus superscript means take the closure of a region. So that just says a region is equal to its, the closure of its interior. It's, uh, and such regions are called regular closed. And here are some examples of regular closed regions. We see uh, this, region, it's, this region is not regular closed. Uh, it's an arbitrary set in the, in the plane, uh, you know, it's, it's, so it's a disk with this sort of some little filaments and isolated points. If you take the interior, the filaments and isolated points go away. If you take the enclosure, you get the boundary back. Okay? Um, again, here is a flanged sphere, uh, beloved of uh, Merio topologists. Um, it is not regular closed. It has a sort of two-dimensional flange. If you take the interior, you get the interior of the sphere. The flange goes away. If you take the closure, you get the sphere back. So basically, regular closed sets are, as it were, full-dimensional objects, but they're, def they're defined by this equation perfectly generally for arbitrary topological spaces. So if T is a topological space, we'll denote its regular closed subsets by T. The regular closed sets of a topological space always form a Boolean algebra. The largest regular closed set containing two regular closed sets A and B is it's simply its union. The minimal set is the empty set. The complement is simply the closure of the set theoretic complement of, uh, of a set. Um, there's no need for the closure operation. There's no need for that. Yeah, oh, so that there should be brackets around that. So, um, so this is the cl the, cl the complement, the set theoret the regular closed complement of a region is the closure of its set theoretic complement, written without the brackets there. Um, and intersection is pretty well the dual. I mean, it's what you think it is. I won't go through the de details. And the Boolean algebra order less than is simply the subset relation. So the upshot of this rather than a messy slide, is that if you take the regular closed sets, these are kind of nice regions to deal with, and they form a Boolean algebra, and you can glom regions together and take intersections and take complements, and everything's fine. Right? And if you've seen it before, it's obvious, and if you haven't seen it before, that's all you need to know for the purposes of this talk. So that's an interpretation, that's what a region is, and now I'm, I can pretty well state my problem. Um, a fra by a frame, I'll keep using this word frame, a frame will be a topological space plus a subset of its regular closed algebra. And you are to think of the subset of its regular closed algebra as the things we allow to be regions within that space. Maybe not all regular closed sets will count as regions. All regions will be regular closed, but we may or may not want to have a smaller collection of re things that we count as regions. So when I talk about a frame, I mean a topological space plus a choice of which regular closed sets we are going to count as regions, that is, which regular closed sets our variables are going to range over. That's it. That's what a frame is. So the regions we want to talk about. 
examples of frames. If T is any topological space, that space together with its whole regular closed algebra is a frame. I just take a topological space, I want everything, every regular closed set to count as a region. Perfectly fine. Okay? And I'll just call it the regular closed sets of the space. I won't keep talking, I won't keep saying T, comma, R, C, T. I'll just talk about the regular closed sets of T. So it's a collection of regular closed sets and, uh, and uh, the topological space. And natural classes of frames, we can look at the, uh, uh, at the class of all frames, uh, all, all frames of the form RCT, all regular closed algebras, that's a class of frames which we may be interested in. Or we may be interested in very specific frames. We may be interested in, for example, the regular closed sets of n-dimensional space for some n. N-dimensional Euclidean space for some n. After all, we live in Euclidean space, not an arbitrary topological space. Okay, so now I can state my problem. Um, I've, I've given an example of a, a, an RCC8 formula. That formula is satisfiable over the frame of regular closed sets in the Euclidean plane. And here are two examples showing that it's satisfiable. Okay? Uh, by contrast, so this formula is satisfiable in the frame of regular closed sets of the Euclidean plane. Proof. That's the proof. Yeah. By contrast, if I add this extra formula, Right, this extra constraint, the resulting formula or resulting set of formula, formulas is not satisfiable over any regular closed algebra. And in fact, therefore, is not satisfiable over the entire class of frames, the regular closed, the regular closed sets of topological spaces. Okay, so the natural question then is the is the following. Given a class of frames, let's say curly F. So, I'm sorry, uh, let, me, th th let me state this again. Uh, for a fixed class of frames that we're interested in, as it might be, the class of all regular closed algebras, or as it might be, the regular closed sets of two-dimensional Euclidean space, or as it might be, the regular closed sets in three-dimensional space, Euclidean space. Given, once we fix the frame class, we have the following problem. Given a set of RCC8 constraints, like this one, Answer, yes or no, that set is satisfiable over the frame class we're interested in. Straight question. And that's the kind of question that I should be asking. And that's what I take to be the essence of spatial reasoning and spatial logics. And I said the first 10 minutes were the most important, and that's about right. Okay, so what do we know about this, this question? Actually, it's fairly easy to answer. The um, uh, satisfiability problem for RCC8 over the class of all uh, topological, regular close uh, algebras of topological spaces is very easy. It, it's n log space complete. In other words, answering that question is computationally very simple. And there are solvers that um, have been developed to do it, and they work very well. Uh, and typically, they work by applying rules, right? Such so that if you know that R1 is a tangential proper part of R2, and R2 is a non-tangential proper part of R3, it follows that R1 is a, tangen a non-tangential proper part of R3. And you can sort of see why that's true. And it turns out that such a system of rules can be developed which is sound and complete for this system. But the important part is, is the actual definition. The uh, thing I want people to really focus on is the definition of the problem, not the rules. The rules are in implementation detail. Often you see in papers, uh, early papers on spatial logic, lots of big tables of these rules. They're in implementation detail, they really are. The important thing is that we have a language, namely the language RCC8, topological primitives, we have a class of frames over which we're interpreting it, for example, the class of all regular closed algebras of topological spaces, and the satisfiability problem has a definite answer, yes or no, in any particular case. We want to be able to answer that question. So it turns out to be computationally very simple, and that's, that's that. In fact, the, this problem is almost insensitive to the topological space over which it's interpreted. It is easy to show that the satisfiability problem for a set of these constraints uh, over any topological space coincides with the satisfiability problem for the, over the regular closed sets in Euclidean space of any dimension. So it doesn't really matter which space we're talking about, the, the answers go are always going to be the same. These are both easy theorems to prove. Okay, so that's the start. What happens when you make the language a little bit more difficult, a little bit more interesting? So 
Um, I take it everyone here will be familiar with the notion of connectedness. In RCC8, you cannot say that a region is connected. Regions are just regular closed sets of space, but nothing requires those regions to be connected. So suppose we add that facility to the language. Suppose we, can say, suppose we add the facility to be able to say that, that a region consists of one piece. There are several notions here. Um, so the first is the, is the standard topological notion of connectedness. And I use this in the usual mathematical sense. This set of, is, of course, not connected. The, 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 uh, blue, the yellow set is not connected. The blue and red sets are connected. There is a slightly different notion, which I want you to bear in mind, and that is the notion of interior connected. So I'll say that a set is interior connected if its topological interior is connected. Thus, the yellow set is not connected, certainly not, and therefore certainly not interior connected. The blue set, which consists of two triangles touching at a point, is not interior connected. Its topological interior consists of two separate pieces. Uh, the red set is interior connected. So I'll often talk about interior connectedness just to mean that when I, I, I say a set is interior connected, I mean nothing more than its topological interior is connected. Uh, for regular closed sets, interior connectedness implies connectedness, not vice versa. And um, by the way, of course, a component of a set is a maximal connected subset of that set. I don't know. I'll need that notion in this talk. <coughs> right. OK. So we can't say that a region is connected in RCC8. So let's add the facility. We'll make the language more expressive. Suppose I can say, suppose I add another predicate, C, which just has the interpretation R is connected. This is mathematically perfectly well defined. So again, I have my satisfiability problem. You give me a set of constraints, including this time constraints of the form this region is connected, and I've got to tell you whether that set of constraints is geometrically realizable in the frame of your choice. For example, the regular closed sets of the Euclidean plane. Just, you know, you give me the constraints, I've got to tell you. Similarly, with interior connectedness, I can take the language RCC8 and ask the following problem. Suppose you give me a set of const RCC8 constraints, but together with the specification of which things are, have to be interior connected, right? This is connectedness in this strong sense, the red, red connectedness, yeah? um, uh, plus the specification of the things which are interior connected. I've got to tell you whether that's geometrically realizable. So we have problems now. The satisfiability problem for RCC8 with connectedness over Euclidean spaces of various dimensions, and similarly RCC8 with interior connectedness. Again, perfectly well-defined problems. What's known about this? Okay. For dimensions, this is dim K is dimension. For dimension greater than three, nothing is interesting. I'm not going to read out this theorem. I shouldn't have even put it on the slide. So for dimension greater than three, um, you can always satisfy, you can always make anything connected. Could, if there's a satisfying arrangement, satisfying some collection of RCC constraints, you can always make any, any subset of the regions uh, involved connected. Okay, so connectedness not interesting in dimensions greater than three. Dimensions equal to dimensions one and two are interesting. Let's talk about dimension two because that's, uh, that's a bit more fun. Okay, so now at this point in the talk, things get a little bit harder, um, but let's, let's see how we get on, okay? So suppose we've got a, um, a graph, any graph in the plane. For example, this graph, vertices, edges. I can encode that graph using, um, using this language RCC8 in an obvious way. So I'll take edges to be, I'll take vertices to be regions R, and I'll take edges to be regions S. And I'll simply write down constraints. So I'll take uh, two, uh, I'll, I'll insist that any two uh, regions encoding um, uh, vertices are disjoint. Any two regions encoding distinct edges are disjoint. And I'll say that an, an ed, a region encoding a vertex overlaps a region encoding an edge just in case the edge is incident on the vertex. Right, so I can encode an other, otherwise disjoint. So if, if, this is a, if we have a graph like this, it's a nice planar graph, I can um, write down the corresponding set of constraints in RCC8 and get an encoding of this graph. It's sort of, I can describe graphs in RCC8 in an obvious way, planar graphs. I'll only be talking about planar graphs here. 
Okay, so now I'm going to write down, I can now write down a formula encoding a cyclic graph. This is a cyclic graph with eight vertices. I can code, just encode the graph using RCC8. It has a nice realizing arrangement. I'm building a formula now. And so just to show you the kind of difficult things that go on with connectedness. So I'll build a formula with regions, RCC8 regions, and they'll overlap in the positions required to simulate this graph. I'm going to add two more regions, T1 and T2, and I'm going to require that these should be interior connected, right? So that one piece, the interiors just consist of one piece. I'm going to require that they touch each other, and I'm going to require that each of these regions, T1 and T2, K equals 1 and 2 here, touch each of the regions encoding this graph externally. Can that be satisfied? So it's a straight question. Can I satisfy this set of constraints? It's just a set of constraints. Remember what the problem is. You give me a set of constraints, including connectedness constraints, I tell you whether it's geometrically realizable. And the set of constraints you've given me here is simply a set of constraints encoding a, a, a cyclic graph together with two regions which are, required to be, which are required to be connected and are required to touch each other and all of the regions encoding the cyclic graph. Can you do it? Well, if you kind of sort of fiddle around with this, it looks impossible, right? Because, um, so the idea is that, you know, you, you want this, re you just think about the region T1, right? T1 has to touch let's say R1 and R5, which is right on the other end of the, well, right diametrically opposite on the circle, these things have to touch. And it looks like you ought to be able to draw an arc through T1, which is one of the regions required to touch all these things on the circle, from right across the circle. So you ought to be able to draw an arc uh, beta, a, a chord, uh, uh, in regions, let's say R1, R5, geometri uh, diametrically opposite, through T1. Okay, so you ought to be able to draw such an arc, beta, right across the circle. Similarly, I can take two other arcs, let's say between R3 and R7, again diametrically opposite in the circle but twisted round, going through region T2, because the requirements you gave me are provide regions T1 and T2 which touch all of these regions around the circle. So I ought to be able to construct such an arc. But T1 and T2 are required to be in external contact, so their interiors don't touch. And the regions R1, R5, R3 and R7 are separated around the, the circle of this thing, so they don't touch each other at all. So it looks like these arcs be beta and beta prime, which ought to exist if this is a realizable arrangement, would have to, uh, uh, would have, th these arcs couldn't, couldn't cross because these two sets are, are disjoint, right? And, but then geometrically, it's obvious that these arcs have to cross. So it looks as if this is a simply impossible situation, a simply impossible arrangement to realize. Okay, so that looks like an example that this collection of constraints, cyclic regions defining a cyclic, constraints defining a cyclic graph, plus these, exter these, these extra regions which have to be connected and touch everything and touch each other seems impossible. You think it's impossible? What about this? Okay, so we have the cyclic, uh, the, the regions realizing the cyclic graph, and then two spiral regions infinitely sort of twisting and touching everything. Oh yes, that's a, that's a realizing arrangement. This is of course, these are of course pathological reason, regions, but they do realize the arrangement. What went wrong? What went wrong is that these are badly behaved regions. So more formally, um, uh, we say that a region has curve selection if every boundary point on that region, for every boundary point on that region, there is a Jordan arc uh, lying, uh, going, lying entirely in the interior of the region and uh, on that boundary point as well. In other words, a region has curve selection if every point on the boundary can be reached from some point in the interior by a Jordan arc lying entirely within the region. These, re the, these pathological regions that we get that I, that I devised to satisfy your apparently impossible set of constraints do not have curve selection. They are pathological regions. Similarly, one can, one can, have, uh, uh, you, you know, I mean, one can have all sorts of pathological regions in the plane. They are, by the way, regular closed. How do we get rid of them? Well, we can easily say, uh, for example, uh, here's, a, here's one way, easy way of getting rid of them. Um, how do we construct, I believe in the next talk we'll, we'll hear about um, half planes. How do we get rid of pathological regions? Okay, so you gave me 
some constraints which apparently were just unsatisfiable. I said, aha, no, they're satisfiable after all by regular closed sets in the plane, but the, the example I gave was, very, was, was clearly mathematically pathological. These are not regions in the common sense sense, right? So uh, how do we get rid of such regions? Well, there are plenty of ways. Perhaps the easiest way is to just look at regular closed polyhedra. And regular closed polyhedra are the things you, th are the things you think they are. So in the plane, these are the regular closed polygons. That is, regular closed sets whose boundaries consist of a finite number of line segments. That's it. That, that's all I need to, to say. So polygons, and they, polygons can be unbounded, they can have holes, they can have many components. They just, their boundaries just have to be defined by a finite set, any number of uh, straight line edges. So that's what, poly, that's what polygons are. And it turns out that the set of constraints that... Uh, right, and this, defined, this gives us a very nice regular closed algebra, the regular closed polyhedra in Euclidean space. That too is a frame. So I don't have to have the whole, all regular closed sets. I could limit extension, to, I could limit my attention to the regular closed polyhedra. That's still a frame. Topological space, collection of uh, regular closed subsets over which I take the variables to range. Even more restrictively, I could, I could look at the regular closed rational polyhedra, that is, the polyhedra whose bounding planes satisfy equations with rational coefficients. Those are, uh, those are a bit easier to deal with. They are... Um, they are, uh, those are easier to deal with because they're, they're, they form a, a countable model. Okay, so what do we know? Okay, so the regular closed uh, uh, algebra, um, uh, yes, what do I, yes, let's just say. So I've just given you an example which shows that for the language RCC8 plus interior connectedness, the regular closed polygons the satisfiability problem for the regular closed polygons is not the same as the satisfiability problem for the regular closed sets in the plane. There are sets of constraints which are satisfiable in, uh, for regular closed sets in the plane, but not over polygons. That is, more generally, not over tame regions. Right? And that's a bit of a surprise. This is a very simple language, just, just ordinary RCC8, these six relations. There's no logic, no quantifiers, no Boolean connectives, just a collection of statements about the topological relations between regions and the requirement for interior connectedness. And already that language can distinguish poly, poly, polygons from non-polygons. It's quite surprising. You, might say, you may say, why interior connectedness? Well, ha what would happen if I just used connectedness? Well, connectedness, it doesn't work. For connectedness, the language RCC8 plus connectedness constraints, that is where you can't say the interior of a region is connected, just the region is connected, that is insensitive to tameness. If a formula is satisfiable over the regular closed sets in the plane, it's satisfiable over the regular closed polygons. Okay, so it, it shows... This, I, I give these examples to show you just how, just how subtle and complicated... These, these sorts of regions are. Uh, these sorts of logics can be. I mean, the simplest possible spatial logics have some quite uh, nasty surprises. Let me just um, talk about what, what happens. You can, uh, let me, I'll, I'll go through this, the next section very, very quickly. I, I'm really racing through it because I think people here may be more interested in first order spatial logic, so I'll try to leave some time for that. One of the things you can do is to add function symbols to RCC8. In RCC8, even with, RCC, even with connectedness, you can't combine regions. So I said that the regular closed sets form a Boolean algebra, but you can't actually do anything in this logic with the Boolean algebra. You can't glom regions together. You can't combine regions in any way. So you could add this facility by adding function symbols to the language. So here's uh, an example of a formula in the so-called language Boolean RCC8. It says R1 overla uh, partially overlaps R2. Uh, R1 partially overlaps R3, and R1 is disjoint from the common part of R2 and R3. And here's a satisfying assignment. Here's the common part of R2 and R3, and R1 is disjoint from it. So in this language, you have Boolean combinators as well. It's a more complicated language. It's called Boolean RCC8, and it was looked at. And again, you have complexity results. And the complexity results basically, complexity is basically the same, except when you're looking at, uh, if you look at um, uh, connected spaces, the complexity goes up slightly, but that's a detail. I want to skip over it at the moment. So you can make the language more complicated by adding Boolean symbols. What if you add both? Okay, so, uh, so uh, let me, I need to explain one other thing. Um, 
this, this RCC8 uh, language, um, okay, so I've said that you've got basic predicates, disconnected, externally connected. Actually, um, if you, take, if you use the pre take the predicate C to be the complement of disconnectedness, in other words, uh, two relations are C, uh, stand in the relation C, if they are in contact, right? That, 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 that does, they have a point in common, any point in common, possibly interior, possibly, exterior, or possibly exterior. So it's the complement of disconnectedness. With the Boolean operators, you can then define all of the RCC8 relations just using contact. So in other words, what we have is two languages. We have the language of Boolean operators, let's say, with equality. That's just Boolean algebra. If you add the contact relation to this, you get BRCC8. So um, call, using B to be the language of Boolean algebra with equality, C to be the result of adding the contact relation, I'll use the language C instead of RCC, BRCC8 because it's shorter. So what happens now when you add connectedness to the languages BC to the languages B and C? So we now have, let, let's, it's really, let's just think about C. So the language C, Boolean RCC8, we can now add connectedness to that as well. So we have now not just the ability to uh, add regions together and we'll take common parts, but say that they're connected. I'm going to go straight to this. So right, you understand the languages we have. Right? We have a language in which we, can have, we have operators, Boole uh, uh, combinators, equality, and connectedness statements, and also... The, the contact relation plus connected, connectedness statements as well. Language is BC, that's Booleans plus connectedness, and CC, Booleans plus contact plus connectedness. In other words, BRCC8 with connectedness. I'm going to go right to the end, because time is marching on. I have until quarter two, is that correct? Yeah, OK. The time is marching on, so I'm just going to go right to the end. Very surprising. Very surprising. I'm just going to go to just say it. Right. The satisfiability problems for the uh, language that's this Boolean RCC8 with interior connectedness, Boolean RCC8 with ordinary connectedness, okay, um, are undecidable over the regular closed polyhedra in any dimension that should be greater than or equal to 2. And, and it's also undecidable uh, for the, what have we got here? Interior connectedness with regular closed polyhedra, um, interior co uh, ordinary connectedness with, with Boolean operators, BRCC8 with ordinary connectedness, regular closed polyhedra, and that seems to be a complete repeat of that. I probably meant uh, the um, uh, ordinary, um, uh, I probably meant non the non-polyhedral regular closed sets. Okay, so um, it, it, it is ab absolutely astonishing um, uh, that the, all of these logics are undecidable. So if you give me a collection, there are no quantifiers here, if you give me a collection of RCC8 constraints, connectedness constraints, plus the ability to merge regions together, the problem of whether that is geometrically realizable, either over the polyhedra, either over the polygons, or over the um, regular closed sets in the plane, or over the polyhedra in every higher dimension, that's an undecidable problem. And you're quite surprising. Such a simple logic, as I stress, no quantifiers at all. So computationally speaking, these um, spatial logics are very, very, um, very, very uh, toxic things. Now I want to go on very quickly to, to first order logic and so fin finish off. And so now, so now it gets sort of a bit less, well, it just gets a bit more hand wavy. Um, actually, if you go back to what Randall, Tsui and Cohn did in, in uh, 1992, um, they employed, they actually defined their, 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 their logic RCC8 in terms of uh, this relation C, this whitehead relation C, and they did everything in, in terms of first order logic. So they thought of this thing in being embedded within a larger theory of first-order logic. And the idea was that you were going to reason in first-order terms with your variables ranging over subsets of some interesting space like Euclidean space. I mean, they didn't know about these, these undecidability results, even for the propositional case, for heaven's sake. I mean, it, this, this, it, these, are, these are quite recent results. And um, when, when you do this, you can actually define lots of interesting things just in terms of C. So, for example, here is the subset relation. Remember, the Boolean order, in, in, it, it coincides with subsets. So, for most frames of interest, 
Um, X1 is a subset of X2, just in case anything which touches X1 touches X2. So you can define lots of things. And of course, they, they noticed that you could define all the RCC relations, uh, in usual first order terms. Uh, and so on. And so, and, and indeed, you can define lots of things. Uh, I mentioned connectedness uh, as being one of the things you might be interested in. In, in uh, let's say, over the regular closed polygons, this formula defines the property of being interior connected. It doesn't really matter what it is, right? It's just, just a big formula. That is, it's a formula in one free variable somewhere. There's a free variable x, right? There's a free variable there, and that just defines the notion of being interior connected. Just does. I mean, you, it's a mathematical, it's a, it's a theorem, right? It's a theorem that over the regular closed polygons in the plane, actually in any Euclidean space of any dimension, that formula is satisfied by a region X, just in case X is interior connected. It's just a theorem. Okay, so you can define uh, things of, uh, 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 in uh, classes of interest. Okay. Okay, so region-based theories of space really have three components. So we have a frame. Topological space, I've done it the odd way, I don't the odd way around to write it, isn't it? Topological space, collection of uh, regular closed sets in that topological space. We have a collection of topological primitives, as it might be connectedness, or as it might be contact, Whitehead's, Whitehead's contact relation, as it might be connectedness, as it might be interior connectedness, as it might be the RCC8 primitives. In the first order setting, it doesn't really matter, they're all interdefinable. And we have a logical syntax, as it might be propositional logic, as it might be first order logic. Okay, the following questions then become salient. What relations can we define? What's the first, what's the theory? Right? What, 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 what statements are true? What other frames have the same theory? What alternative models does this theory have? So if, you want, if you're interested philosophic, from a philosophical point of view in theories of space, you can, just, you can say, right, I'm going to take some standard model of space, take a language, I've got my geometrical primitives, I've got my, my logical syntax, there will be a theory of that language. There will be a set of sentences which are true in that language, and we can ask lots of technical questions, like what can you define, what computational properties does a, thing, uh, a theory have, what alternative models does it have, how do they relate to the standard model. Here are some very, very quick answers. Okay? So there, it's going, it's going to go very quickly. On the expressive power question, over the regular closed polygons, every tuple satisfies a topologically complete formula. So I'm going to look at regular closed polygons in, in the in just Euclidean plane. Um, with, uh, and again, the language, uh, uh, let's talk about the language C, the language with the whitehead primitive C. You can always write down a formula. For any tuple of regions, you can write down a formula which characterizes that tuple exactly. The same is true in three dimensions. Don't know about higher dimensions. In fact, Ernie Davis recently showed that Almost any, I'll just say it very, very quickly, almost any topological relation that you could possibly think of uh, definable over the regular closed polygons, the regular closed polyhedra, is definable in, in, as a first order formula in the language with C. Almost anything. I mean, that's, that's a gross paraphrase of what he wrote, but I don't have much time. Okay, so expressive power of first order logics is provably very, very high. Okay, that, that, this, is, this is a great paper, by the way, uh, Ernie Davis, 2013, so you can ask me about it later. Um, okay, axiomatic characterizations. I said, if you give me, if we have a theory of, of interest, let's say the regular closed polygons, and a language, which is fixed, let's say the whitehead primitive contact plus first order logic, there will be a theory, there will be a set of true sentences. Can it be axiomatically characterized? Oh, yes. You can axiomatically characterize that language. Again, this is a perfectly straight mathematical question. It has an answer. Um, and there are, there are details of that. Again, I don't want to go into. Um, the axiom, axiom system will involve some infinitary uh, inference rule or something odd, because this is an undecidable theory. So there certainly can't be any Hilbert, complete Hilbert axiomatization, because that would make it decidable. But there's, there are axiomatizations, if you allow infinitary rules of inference. There are. Uh, axiomatic characterizations of the set of sentences which are true in this theory of interest. 
Okay, I know nothing, that's for the polygons, I know nothing about the regular closed sets in the Euclidean plane. This is a very, these are very difficult objects to deal with. If anyone wants to solve this problem for me, I'd be very interested. Okay, alternative models. Right, last, last point, really. Um, suppose we have a theory. Okay, so remember what the, the thing is. There's a, a, we start off with a basic concrete model of interest, the regular closed polygons in the plane. We have a language which is fixed. Um, Whitehead's contact relation with first order logic. We ha that defines a theory. I can now ask what alternative models of there are there of that theory and, what, and what, how do they relate to the standard model? And quite surprising result. So let's look for concreteness at the language, actually not with Whitehead's contact relation, the language with interior connectedness and part of. It, it's, it's just as good. It's, it's, it's fine. And let's look at the standard model consisting of the regular closed polygons. It's easy to see that the regular closed... Something's happened to... Oh, right. It's easy to see uh, that the regular closed rational polygons is also a model of this theory. It doesn't matter whether you have regular closed polygons, regular closed rational polygons, actually regular closed semi-algebraic sets, for those who know what those are. Basically, basically, as long as the struck, as long as the objects are well behaved in the sense that I talked about earlier, none of these funny infinite spirals, no, no lack of curve selection, finite numbers of components for everything. As long as the models are tame, as long as the objects in your uh, ontology in your frame are tame, they will have the same theory. You can show that easily from the axiomatization. You just check the axioms are true. Easy. So pretty well all tame collections of regions in the plane have the same theory. What theory? Well, and what are its alternative models? Here is a really quite surprising uh, a theorem which I will finish with. If you take the regular closed rational polyhedra, polyhedra with rational bounding lines, whose bounding lines are, satisfy rational equations, it turns out that that model is elementarily embeddable in every other model of the theory. In other words, it's the, smaller mod the smallest model. So the model we start off with, right, namely the polyhedra in the plane, turns out to be, in a, it model theoretically, the simplest model of its theory. If you take any other model, even an abstract model of the same theory, and this is a region-based theory, remember, models can be arbitrary, arbitrary mathematical objects. The rational polyhedra are embeddable elementarily in any other model. So other models are a little bit kind of, uh, you know, it's just extra junk, right? <laughs> it's the thing we started off with, with extra junk. So I've presented a wealth of results on, on region-based spatial logics. So I said, why all the negativity? So the prospect of establishing a theory of, region, of space based on regions is an attractive one. The questions accompanying it are, I hope you'll agree, non-trivial and worth asking. It's just that the answer, it's not that there's nothing wrong with the questions, it's the answers, right? they turn out to be rather negative. Are there any computational advantages? Pretty bad. Um, do you avoid mathematical pathologies? Even the simplest theories, not really, right? Right, that they're sensitive to the really pathological shapes. Do you get any insights into the alternative models? Well, yes, you do. To be fair, you do. But really, the simplest one is almost the one, the first one you might think up with ge geometrically, concretely. So, and hence, hence the, the scepticism in my uh, t title. However, um, of course, I've just scratched the surface, and I invite you to finish with a shameless advertisement for the Handbook of Spatial Logic, which contains a wealth of fascinating material on this subject, uh, of which I have hardly been able to speak at all. Thank you for your attention. Thanks.